Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call. Today, let's get right into it. This package comes from Chris in Bordertown, New Jersey. Hello to all my New Jersey viewers. I'm opening this upside down, so let's see what we have here. All right, lots of goodies here. All right, first off, would you look at that? That is an IBM PC Junior keyboard, the later version, of course, the non-chiclet version that supposedly is better, although um, feels pretty crappy, and it's not this particular keyboard. They all are like that. They just don't feel very good. Now, what this keyboard has that I don't actually have is the keyboard cable. But you know what? Now that I think about it, I don't think that this is the original keyboard cable for the PC Junior. And the reason why is I'm pretty sure while it looks like a phone jack connector on the keyboard side, I think on the back of the computer, it's some other type of connector. Well, I just did a quick Google to see if I could find someone with the original keyboard cable. And here is one from Reset Retro Computing. Reset Retro Computing. I'm assuming these are things that came from PC Reset, perhaps? And it looks like, yeah, okay, so it's exactly as I thought. And indeed, I know it's not gonna be easy to see, but it looks like one side of the cable is an RJ45 and the other side is some kind of like square, din-looking cable. So unfortunately, this one is probably from like a Macintosh or potentially like a regular telephone or something like that. And indeed, looking inside this connector here is black, red, green, yellow, and then yellow, green, red, black. So it's like flipped. And I found a thread on 68K MLA, and this user was talking about how they bought a 512K Mac, and the keyboard is dead, and this was the cable that it came with. So it is flipped as well. So black and black, and yellow and yellow, which is just like this cord. And unfortunately, with the Macintosh, if you use the wrong cable, then it destroys the keyboard controller inside the keyboard because I think it reverses the polarity on the power. I mean, honestly, the fact that Apple did that is horrible, like such a bad design on their part to make it where if you just used a regular phone handset cable, which is probably exactly what this is, your keyboard is destroyed. I was trying to find a picture of an actual Macintosh cable, but I couldn't find one. So I went into my parts bin and I found one right here. So it's probably gonna be impossible to see, but unlike the other cord, this one is black, red, green, yellow, and on the other connector, it's black, red, green, yellow. So it's the same on both connectors. And to reiterate, on this cord, it was plugged into the PC Junior, which is uh, not the right cable. This is yellow, green, red, black, and then black, red, green, yellow. So they're flipped. And this is standard for a telephone and would work on any telephone or like a K-Pro. And this is what the Macintosh needs, and if you use this, your keyboard is dead. Anyhow, not all is lost. This keyboard can, of course, be used still because it has infrared on it. The PC Junior has an infrared receiver. I have a video, which I'll uh, put in the link description, to my PC Junior series, where the one I ended up buying locally, like used, is a while back, it didn't even have the IR receiver in it. So luckily, a very nice viewer of mine sent me the IR receiver, so I was able to get the keyboard working. Now, of course, since it's IR, it uses batteries. So let's try to get the battery. So let's get the battery door off. And luckily it looks good. No leakage and no damage on the inside. I mean, this entire keyboard, I gotta say, looks extremely mint. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this is new old stock that I don't think this thing was ever actually used. It even still has the film over the PC Junior logo, but look at the space bar there. It's, absolutely pristine. So that's pretty sweet. I'm sure this thing works. Unfortunately, my PC Junior is up in storage right now, uh, so it's hard to get to, so I can't easily test this right now, but I'm sure that this works. All right, next up, what do we got here? Looks like we have a Commodore data set for the TED series of machines. So that's the 264, the Plus 4, or the Commodore 16. It uses a different connector on here, now it's the same electrically as all the other data sets, so you could use an adapter, but let's see what's in here. Looks like a tape that says Mrs. Gox Job, and on the back, Cone. And I see this is a Timex tape, so it must have been reused. And there's a tape that came with it as well for the C16, Wizard of the Princess. Now, of course, this would work on the Plus 4, it's just that uh, it wouldn't take advantage of that extra memory on the Plus 4, which is one of the downfalls of that entire line of computers. 
everything was designed for the lowest common denominator, which was the Commodore 16. It says here it's a multi-part adventure. And look at that, there's a 3D mode there and some other stuff. But this looks like it's a port from something else because it's not even using any of the 16 colors that the Commodore 16 has. And here's the tape, it looks like it's pretty long. Side two is a copy of side one. Okay, well that's handy in case your tape gets eaten or something like that. And here are the liner notes. The Wizard and the Princess is a multi-part graphic adventure. The game is divided into five parts and you must use arcade skills to negotiate each level. Your task is to find the evil wizard's castle, defeat the guardian dragons, negotiate the labyrinth passages and rescue the princess from the clutches of the wizard and his monsters. But beware, the return journey is just as perilous. The VIC-20 version of The Wizard and the Princess by the same author was a consistent number one bestseller. It was voted best adventure game in 1984 by Commodore Games. And we have some extra info right here. Classification, graphic adventure, five-part adventure, level, beginner to intermediate, completion time, weeks, and made in the UK. And inside the liner notes here, we have a registration card for Melbourne House, the manufacturer, C16 version. Where did you learn about this product? What age are you? 10 to 15, 16 to 19, 20 to 24, over 25. There's the address in the UK for the publisher there. And there's also an Australian office, of course, in Melbourne. And then please cross out inapplicable address. Inapplicable. <laughs> that's, just, that's just funny. So what, you're trying to mail this like this? Like you put a stamp here, you mail this floppy thing through the mail? Not quite sure that's, that's gonna work. And there we have some instructions about the game. And here's some additional information. There are the controls right there. It doesn't even use the arrow keys. I think eventually there'll be a day where I don't have a huge backlog of mail calls and maybe doing some playthroughs of games like this might be kind of fun. I have a bunch of old cassette tapes for the ZX Spectrum and the Commodores and stuff like that. Might be kind of fun to boot these up and give them a try. All right, there's another big bunch of things here. Ooh, it looks like we have IC chips. I love it. There is an absolute ton of chips here. So I think I'm gonna mount the camera above the bench here and we'll just give a quick, quick run through of these ICs. All right, last time I did a run through of ICs, I used the white background of that pad on my desk and it kind of blew out a lot of the shots or it underexposed them. So it was hard to read the ICs. So hopefully this will be a little easier. All right, here is the first one. So I have no idea what this PLCC IC is here. This is an SA70 or something from 1999. If anyone has any clues, uh, let me know, please. And then for the most part, these are just 74 LS logic chips, kept, except we have a couple gals here, a 22 CV10 and a gal 18 V8. So I think those are reusable gals. Next up is, oh boy, those are, I think some kind of like very old school seven segment displays. Looks like we have a TIL 311 Taiwan 7602. I'm pretty sure this is a seven segment display and it's right down here around this area. Now being from this old time period, these LEDs are gonna be very dim compared to modern stuff. And it looks like there's actually some kind of a die up here right there as well. So perhaps that does some kind of binary decoding or something right on this uh, seven segment display instead of doing it externally. And as you can see here, we have a whole slew of them. And there it is, I just looked it up, TIL 311 hexadecimal display with logic. So here's the data sheet, internal TTL MSI IC logic with a latch decoder and divider, wide viewing angles, high brightness. All right, and there's the display. It's obviously made up of little individual LED chips. Oh, that's gonna look so cool. And it looks like it has a four bit latched input here, a decoder, constant current driver. We have a blanking input pin and looks like a decimal point you can uh, hook up. And then there are all the individual LED chips that make up the actual display. And here are the pinouts here. So pin eight, blanking input, four bit input there, LED supply, left decimal, logic supply, omitted, those aren't even hooked up, right decimal and strobe. And since it's a four bit input, it supports hexadecimal. So zero through F is possible. And it's actually pretty cool. Like take a look at the seven, it has pixels all the way up into the corner, but then the eight is actually rounded. And then letters like A and B are possible because that corner pixel is not always on like a seven segment display. A normal seven segment display would have to show a D as like a lowercase D, otherwise that would just look like a zero with these corners filled in. 
And indeed, we can see that here, like these two pixels there, and those two and these two are paralleled. But these ones in the corner are actually driven separately, so they can be turned off and on on their own. What I think is interesting is this data sheet here comes from Taos and has a date of 2004. But these had date codes from 1976 on them. So I'm curious, like, why there's this difference here. Does anyone know, like, did Taos buy the Texas Instrument, uh, what is these called, little display manufacturing business, something like that? These things seem super interesting. If anyone has any ideas of uh, cool projects that, you know, would go into old 70s computer where these would be handy, uh, yeah, put some comments down below. All right, moving on. Uh, looks like here, oh, this is actually a Motorola 68010, but it's a PLCC package. I can't say I've ever seen one of these, but with this, it would be possible to get something like a Macintosh Classic a CPU upgrade. I have to remove the old CPU, which is surface mounted on. It's the uh, same package as this. And then I could pop this on and get that slight speed boost that you get out of using a 68010 versus 68000. All right, we got some more interesting chips here. This is a uh, 12 megahertz 68000. This is an NEC Commodore chip here, 315093-02. So that's gonna be some chip for like an Amiga or something. Uh, same here, this is a Commodore 5719. So I'm not exactly sure what that is off the top of my head. I can't quite read the markings on this IC. It's really completely worn off. Although, does that say 6502? So I guess that's maybe a processor. And right here, a VLSI 65C816. So the processor from the Apple II GS. Of course, the Super Nintendo uses 65C816, but I don't think it's a, any kind of a package like this. It's some kind of a integrated product into some other chip that Nintendo made. But there is the actual standalone chip right there. And it is possible to use this with an adapter in other 6502 machines like a VIC-20. And I think you could take advantage of some of those extra 16-bit capabilities in here with the right programming, of course. Next up, we have, I think, an 8362R8 Commodore chip there and then an 8364R7. And down here's a Rockwell 338-6503 or 11453. I'm not even sure what that is. Down here, we have a National Semiconductor IC, the National Semiconductor 32081D-10. No idea what that is. And then these IC are all 74 LS logic or these are 40 series logic right here. All right, next sheet here, we have a 6502. We have an NEC V20. Then we have two Intel 8085s, so I think these are like the precursors to the 8086. We have a Rockwell 6522, so that's like an I.O. controller. Actually, we have two of these right here. A 16V8 GAL, some 74LS Logic, an AY-3-8910 sound chip. I think this would go in what, like a, a MSX computer or something like that? Ah, pretty sweet. We have an 8287-10 math code processor for a 286 machine, and it's the uh, 10 megahertz version, so it's kind of the faster one. Then the much more common, is it the dash two or dash five, the five megahertz part? And up here we have a 2650A, no idea what that is. And then this right here is an SRAM chip. I think it's 512 kilobytes. All right, next sheet. So we have these high density sockets. These happen to be what the PLA on the short board C64s is. Now there's a Yamaha chip plugged in there to that one. The chip says V9958, Yamaha 1988. I have no idea what this is. Look at the date code in 1994, though. We have some Motorola 6809s, considered one of the best 8-bit processors of all time. It is the successor to the 6800 that's in my Southwest Technical PC machine, and there's actually a CPU card I can get for that to upgrade it to this, uh, this later chip. We have a 6502 from Moss. We have a 6560, which I think is the uh, video chip from the VIC-20. Two 6522s, that's the I.O. chips that are used in the VIC-20, among other machines. And here's another chip with high-density pins that would fit into one of these sockets here, an HD 64180RP6. All right, next up, we have EEPROMs on here. We have static RAM chips on here. We have uh, Atmel 2900 series, so these are 29C5256s, electronically erasable program read-only memories. Uh, this is the old MT RAM. I think this is going to be uh, 4164. It's basically like what would be on Commodore 64. Probably bad, or half of those are bad. These chips here are two 114 SRAMs, so it's uh, one kilobyte times four bits. You need two of these to equal one kilobyte of RAM. And then these chips here, which are made in Ireland, are 4464s. So two of these chips is 64K, and that's used on the Commodore 64 shortboards as an example. Here's some more SRAMs. This is a, the thin package. And we have some MSN 3764s. I am pretty sure this is all just uh, 4164 DRAM as well. 
So eight of these chips equals 64K, a beautiful ceramic with gold package. All right, we're still going. Here's another sheet. I'll try to go a little bit faster. I don't really recognize these chips. These are AMD 9513 APCs. So we have five of those. And these are 9519 APCs. We have uh, four of those. And more AMD chips here, Z8530Hs. Um, there's two of those. Some miscellaneous 74LS logic here. 9517A, two of those. And there's an AM9511A. None of these large IC numbers seem familiar to me, but yeah, I'm thinking that these are all sort of like clones of the Intel chipsets that were used with the 8088 and 8086 processor, stuff like that. All right, here's the next sheet here. These all look like PICs. These are PIC uh, microprocessors. 18F452s, a bunch of these. So the 40 bin dip version. These are smaller PIC chips, 18F, looks like 26Ks. And these are also PICs, and these are PICs, these are all PICs. So these are all microcontrollers. And here we are on the last sheet here. So we have some crystal oscillators. We have a gal chip here. Uh, what is this, a MAX232? So it's like an RS-232 level converter. YMZ284s. I'm not sure, are these like the DAC for Yamaha sound chips, for instance? We have some more PIC microcontrollers. We have some 74LS logic. This looks like a single DRAM chip, maybe like a 64K times one bit. We have Intel 8251s right here, which are definitely like, I think, a chip that's used in the PC architecture. And then right here, we have some MM58174ANs. These are national semiconductors. And then we have what I think are op amps. So that is it for the IC collection. I just sort of zoomed through that. Hopefully uh, that wasn't too boring. So that is pretty awesome. And we have this beautiful new old stock IBM PC Junior keyboard here. And of course the uh, data set for the Commodore Plus 4 and C16 and the cassette there, plus the, uh, the one right here that was in it. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Chris, for sending in all this stuff. This is pretty darn cool. And that's gonna be it for this mail call episode. If you enjoyed it, I appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Put your comments down below in the comment section if you have any, and of course hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, it really helps me out. I wanna thank my patrons, their name are scrolling up the side of the screen. And if you wanna become a patron, get early access to videos and whatnot, you can do so at the link in the description below. And I guess that is that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.